The reading is taken from 1 Samuel, chapter 12. Samuel said to all Israel, I have listened to everything you said to me and have set a king over you. Now you have a king as your leader. As for me, I am old and gray, and my sons are here with you. I have been your leader from my youth until this day. Here I stand. Testify against me in the presence of the Lord and his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Whose donkey have I taken? Whom have I cheated? Whom have I oppressed? From whose hand have I accepted a bribe to make me shut my eyes? If I've done any of these, I will make it right. You have not cheated or oppressed us, they replied. You have not taken anything from anyone's hand. Samuel said to them, the Lord is witness against you and also his anointed is witness this day that you have not found anything in my hand. He is witness, they said. Then Samuel said to the people, it is the Lord who anointed, who appointed Moses and Aaron and brought your forefathers up out of Egypt. Now then, stand here, because I am going to confront you with evidence before the Lord as to all the righteous acts performed by the Lord for you and your fathers. After Jacob entered Egypt, they cried to the Lord for help, and the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, who brought your forefathers out of Egypt, and settled them in this place. But they forgot the Lord their God, and he sold them into the hands of Sisera, the com commander of the army of Hazor, and into the hands of the Philistines and the king of Moab, who fought against them. They cried out to the Lord and said, We have sinned, we have forsaken the Lord, and served the Baals and the Ashtoreths. But now deliver us from the hands of our enemies, and we will serve you. Then the Lord sent Jerobbaal, Barak, Jephthah and Samuel, called Samson, and he delivered you from the hands of your enemies on every side so that you lived securely. But when you saw that Nahash, king of the Ammonites, was moving against you, you said to me, no, we want a king to rule over us, even though the Lord, your God, was your king. Now here is the king you have chosen, the one you asked for, See, the Lord has set a king over you. If you fear the Lord and serve and obey him and do not rebel against his commands, and if both you and the king who reigns over you follow the Lord your God, good. But if you do not obey the Lord, if you rebel against his commands, his hand will be against you as it was against your fathers. Now then, stand still and see this great thing the Lord is about to do before your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest now? I will call upon the Lord to send thunder and rain, and you will realize what an evil thing you did in the eyes of the Lord when you asked for a king. Then Samuel called upon the Lord, and the same day the Lord sent thunder and rain, so all the people stood in awe of the Lord and of Samuel. The people all said to Samuel, Pray to the Lord your God for your servants, so that we will not die. For we have added to all our other sins the evil of asking for a king. Do not be afraid, Samuel replied. You have done all this evil, yet do not turn away from the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Do not turn away after useless idols. They can do you no good, nor can they rescue you, because they are useless. For the sake of his great name, the Lord will not reject his people, because the Lord was pleased to make you his own. As for me, far be it from me that I should sit against the Lord by failing to pray for you. And I will teach you the way that is good and right. But be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart, Consider what great things he has done for you. Yet, if you persist in doing evil, both you and your king will be swept away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Tom, thank you for reading that for us. Let's pray as we come to God's word together. Gracious God, we thank you that you are a faithful God who, who speaks to us by your Spirit's power through your words. And as you have in the past, we pray that you will do so again for your name's sake. Amen. If I were to ask you, um, in terms of characteristics you expect of a person or, or a person that you'd like, uh, where would you put loyalty? Where would you put loyalty in terms of characteristic? Is it near the top or is it sort of somewhere sort of more towards the middle or, or maybe you don't care about it at all, it's totally at the bottom and uh, you're all sort of, you know, there we go. Uh, where would you put it? And then if you were to think about loyalty and sort of have a loyalty scale, how would you rank yourself? How loyal are you to your family, to your friends? How loyal are you to your workplace? And ultimately, how loyal would you say you were to God? How faithful? I mean, obviously you're here physically this morning, so that's, that's a good start. But, but how loyal are you spiritually? Are you expectant this morning? How faithful are you when he calls us to take up our cross and follow him? Does that mean that we are expecting and are living sacrificially in every area of life? And then I suppose the question is, how faithful do you have to be? Now, as we come to 1 Samuel 12, uh, we have this sort of renewing of the kingship. It, uh, right at the end of chapter 11, uh, uh, Saul has defeated uh, Nahash, the king uh, of the Ammonites, and, and they gather together uh, at the mountain and, and reaffirm the kingship. Uh, and from chapter 8 through to the end of chapter 12, it's this whole section about whether Israel should have a king or, or not. Uh, but in reality, uh, the king that they were asking for was a king like the nations around them. The request itself wasn't wrong, but, but that they would ask for one like the nations around them. Because with a human king comes human power, human security, human status. And, and it has now been provided. But the problem is it's human power human security and in reality it's a rejection of God's power God's security God's um, status that he gives them and it's as relevant today for us in Jesus kingdom as we look at whether we'll follow the power of the world and what that offers us and how we fit in with the power of God's kingdom you see, uh, within our world today, very easily, human reason can be used to understand and explain a lot of life, and do so without reference to God. Human institutions uh, give us a purpose and a value without necessarily giving us uh, any form of reference to God. So think of um, the religion uh, that happened yesterday afternoon uh, in football stadiums all around the country. A real purpose, real status, real value, a, a thing that gives people life and meaning. Now, it's not to say that that's necessarily all a bad thing, but so very easily we try and find uh, our purpose, our meaning, our security, our status all outside of who God is. Now, not all human power is godless. It doesn't have to be a conflict between this world uh, and uh, God's kingdom. In fact, Christians are to be involved in every area of human life. We are, after all, human and supposed to be human and involved in human life. But how will it resolve? And so there are two real questions that I think we're going to look at this morning. One is, uh, what do we do with faithfulness? Uh, and what about power? Where does it come from? Uh, and in terms of relation to how we respond to it and how we see that from God. Because power isn't necessarily always godless. In verses 1 to 5, I think that's the big thing that Samuel is talking about. He time and again asks the question, have I taken? Have I taken? Uh, have I been uh, unfair? Testify me against, against me in the presence of the Lord. Whose ox have I taken? Whose donkey have I taken? Who am I cheated? Who have I oppressed? And the answer is, no one's. And that is in contrast to the warning that he gives in, in 1 Samuel 8 about a king who will take their wives, take their sons, take their daughters, take their fields, take their food, take their donkeys, and take their flocks. 
Here is one who has uh, lived as a leader amongst God's people. He is now old and gray. He has been serving them since his youth. Here is one who has not taken but has given. So it is possible to be a leader under God's own design. But one of the big things we'll see as we go through from verses 6 onwards is God's faithfulness. And so in verses 6 to 11, I said this is God's past faithfulness despite Israel's unfaithfulness. So Samuel says to them, stand here. Uh, stand here uh, before us. A little bit like you might do to a child. Say, stand here while I talk to you. And, and Samuel has been absolved of all guilt, and now he is about to declare God's faithfulness to them, as well as their unfaithfulness. So verse 7, stand here because I'm going to confront you with evidence before the Lord as to all the righteous acts performed by the Lord for you and your ancestors. And what he'll go through from verses, um, uh, from verses 9 through to 12 is sort of a cycle of Israel's history. And so first of all, we have that they cry out to the Lord. And, uh, and then uh, as they cry out to the Lord, the Lord sends some form of rescuer. And so he brings them out of Egypt. Uh, he rescues them from the hand of the Philistines. And so they're rescued. And then what happens is that they forget and so then the Lord sells them into slavery, or, or a, an army comes. As a result, they will cry out to the Lord. The Lord sends a rescuer. They're rescued, they forget. Uh, and so then the Lord sends them into, uh, into uh, face some form of king or opposition. So they cry out to the Lord. And, and this goes on and on and on throughout all of Israel's history. We see their unfaithfulness and God's ongoing faithfulness and his great grace. But I wonder how this makes you feel. It feels a little bit, doesn't it, that if you don't do what God says, he'll send a marauding army. Does that make you feel uncomfortable? It feels like an abuse of power. And indeed, it could possibly be, unless we ask the question, for what purpose? Why does God send this army? And fundamentally, it is to draw them back to himself. If you think of how the cycle starts, and we see it in verse 8, they're, they're in Egypt, and they cry out to the Lord for help, and the Lord sends Moses who brings their ancestors out and settles in this place. He, he has his people he longs for them to be his people and for them to be their God. And he wants to draw them back to himself time and again because it's a place of safety. It's a place of blessing. It's a place of goodness. I suppose maybe you could think of a, of a child-parent relationship where the child is so ongoing rebellious. Uh, they want to be free, so, so you, you set them free. You let them go. They, they can do what they like with the hope that one day they would see your love and return. That's what happens in the story of the prodigal son, is it not? The father is so loving, so generous, so good, that in the depths he realizes how foolish he's been. And he knows that his father will receive him back. But also, I think, we need to understand that to be outside of a relationship with God is awful. Do we believe that? That lives without him, and without his love, without his rule, without his guidance, and without his security is hell on earth? Even if we don't know it. It might be that we think we can get on by okay. It may well be that it looks like people living outside of God are surviving and thriving. And it might be okay if we prosper. Now, it may not be kings that come and threaten our lives. But one day there will be something that you will face that you cannot handle alone and can do nothing about. It could be sickness but ultimately it will be death. 
At some point, you will face something that you can do nothing about, you cannot avoid, and you cannot defeat. You cannot survive it. And so God draws us back to himself who can and in eternity will defeat all those things. The evidence of that is that Jesus is not dead, but he is raised. Now, in the Old Testament, there is also a, a real element of, of punishment, too, because it is treason to take God's good gifts and thank another. But in the New Testament, we need to look at the cross. And at the cross, we will see that Jesus takes the punishment for all our sin. And so Romans 8 will say there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But the Bible does talk about discipline. That God does teach us so we know who he is, that we know his love, and that we're brought back to him so that we rely on him, so we see our need for him before it's too late. Because it is best for us to be in relationship with him. And so Samuel begins by highlighting to them, look at God's faithfulness to you in the past, despite your unfaithfulness. And then in verses 12 to 19, we see God's present faithfulness to them, despite their ongoing unfaithfulness. So you look in verses 12 to 15 um, again, and we see um, their current circumstances. They saw that Nahash, king of the Ammonites, was moving against them. Do you remember the cycle? That because of their sin, because they forget the Lord, God sends a king to come and attack. And so what happens throughout all of history? They cry out to the Lord for help, and he sends a deliverer and rescues them. What happens here is that they've forgotten the Lord, so the Lord sings King Nahash of the Ammonites, and what should they do is they should cry out to the Lord for help. But what do they do? They say, no, we want a king to rule over us. And that's how they respond. Rather than appealing to the Lord for rescue and for help, they ask for a king. They ask for a king, and in fact, actually, in chapter 11, they are willing to even have Nahash rule over them because they want someone who will provide security for them. Now, God graciously gives them their ideal king. He is tall, he is handsome, and he is decent uh, in battle. But there is a warning for them, as well as real clarity for them. Verse 13, now here is the king you've chosen, and the Lord has set a king over you. Verse 14, if you fear the Lord and serve and obey him and do not rebel against his commands, and if both you and the king who reigns over you follow the Lord your God, good. But if you do not obey the Lord, and if you rebel against his commands, his hand will be against you as it was against your father's. Now, in your own time, you can read Deuteronomy 29, 30, and 31, and that talks about how God's people and how the covenant is formed, that, that God loves them, they are his people, and he says to them that if you um, love me, if you are faithful, if you obey me, all will go well with you in the land. But if you're unfaithful, God will be faithful, and he will punish you in order to draw you back. And you notice how in verses 14 to 15, largely that's exactly what is said here. That actually, uh, when we come to think about the conflict between um, earth and heavenly power, is that earthly power works as long as it is under the heavenly power. As long as it submits itself to God's rule. So here we have in verses 14 and 15, exactly the same as they had before they had a king. In many respects, God is king, and they've just added another layer of management that they are to obey. And actually, with a king, uh, often it's a king that might lead them astray, or, or the king might draw them back. And so it, it, it's good that they have a king, but it's a king that is to rule under God and his kingship. And then he provides them with evidence in verse 16 to 19 of God's great power. So verse 16 says, see this great thing the Lord is about to do before your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest now? I will call upon the Lord to send thunder and rain 
and you will realize what an evil thing you did in the eyes of the Lord when you asked for a king. Now, we're given a couple of details. It's the wheat harvest, which um, you all know that uh, if you're um, a farmer in, uh, uh, in the Middle East, at wheat harvest time, it is always dry. There is no rain. So here comes the rain and the thunder. It is a little bit like saying, it's going to snow in the desert. And then it happens. But also there's real risk because, of course, the harvest may well be destroyed. And then do you see what happens as a result of that? They remember the Lord. Samuel calls on the Lord. And so the people stand in awe of the Lord and of Samuel. And they say, pray to the Lord your God for your servants so he may not die. They, they appeal to him once again to save them and to rescue. Uh, they, they have learned their lesson. And the reassurance from Samuel is that you won't be destroyed, yet you have done all this evil in the Lord's sight. So we've seen how God has been faithful in the past, despite their unfaithfulness. He is faithful to them in the present, despite their unfaithfulness. And now we'll see that God will be faithful in the future, despite their unfaithfulness, in verses 20 to 25. Now here's the question I've got for you. Why doesn't God just finish them off? I mean, quite frankly, they deserve it. Yeah, if you think of the faithfulness scale of Israel, I mean, they are rebellious again and again and again. Surely they're past it now. And now maybe we think, well, well, no, of course God can't destroy them, because after all, I mean, they're probably, they're, not, they're probably not that bad. Uh, and and yeah, there will be some faithful people there. Well, the answer is there in verse 22. And so look at verse 22, and and I want this to be what rings in your ears as we leave this morning. For the sake of his great name, the Lord will not reject his people, because the Lord was pleased to make you his own. Verse 22 is a staggering verse. Why will he not destroy them? Because he said he wouldn't. Because he said, you are my people, so he will not destroy them. And for him to do anything else or anything different would be to deny himself, to ruin his reputation and diminish his glory. You see, when he chose them, it's not that he didn't know what they'd be like. He knew that they were human and therefore would be full of sin and rebellion and wickedness. And yet he chose them. He loved them, they are his, and therefore he will do nothing to destroy them. And I suppose we could ask the question, therefore, to ourselves, what means that you will go to heaven? Uh, What gives you confidence that you're a Christian? Or, Or maybe we can ask it slightly more negatively, what gives you doubts that you aren't? You see, a false confidence comes from any answer that begins, I So I pray, I read the Bible, I go to church, I give to charity, I serve. You see, the reality is at some point that might stop or you might start being wobbly in those areas and then our confidence begins to be hit. But the true answer of why you can be sure you're going to heaven, that you have absolute confidence you're a Christian, is because you can say, because God saved me, I am his own, and he will never give up on me. And that is the answer we can give. It's not because you're particularly glorious or wonderful, and certainly I am not, but it is because he will never give up on me. So look to the cross. Look to what God did to rescue and save his people for all eternity. He, sp- he did not spare his only son for you because he will not give up on us. And the cross reminds us that he loves us, not because we're lovely, but because he does. Because he's committed to the honor of his name, and therefore he will never let you go, he will never let you down, and he will not let the church go either. So I hope that lines your heart, that it's not based on your ability, but our ongoing uh, assurance of faith is because he loves you and he will not let you go. 
Because of his great name, he will not reject his people, despite our unfaithfulness. You are secure because God says you are. In the same way that as you walk across the road with a small child, uh, they are not safe because they're gripping onto you, but because you're gripping onto them. It's not about how much faith we have, but because our faith is in God that we're secure. And it's not about my faith, but about his faithfulness. Now, the temptation will be, therefore, to think, well, if I'm absolutely secure in his love, then I can do whatever I like. If it's not about my performance, I can just go and do whatever. But look what Samuel says in verses, verse 20. He says, you've done this evil, yet do not turn away from the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. So because we know we will not be let go by him, then serve him with all your heart. Are you serving the Lord with all your heart in every area of life? Are you serving him in your, in your workplace? Are you serving him in your friendships? Are you serving him in your marriage? Are you serving him in church life? In verse 21, uh, he'll say, Do not turn away after useless idols. They can do no good, nor can they rescue you, because they are useless. So because of God's faithfulness, don't go serving other things. Look at the power. He can defeat death. Look at his faithfulness to you. Do not wander away. Verse 23, Samuel says, I will teach you what is right and good. So because he has been faithful to us, let us listen to him so we know what is right and good. Let us be reading the scriptures every day so we know how we ought to live. Verse 24, he says, be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. But we don't do it because we need to prove to him our faithfulness. But because he is faithful, we can serve him in faithfulness. I hope you marvel at God's faithfulness, that nothing can thwart it. Will you delight and meditate on his power to save? And so seek him and seek to obey him in all of life. This is Samuel's final public speech, and he calls on God's people to be faithful because God is powerful to save, and because God always has been faithful, he is faithful and always will be faithful. And so because of his faithfulness, we are free to serve, not out of fear, not in order to earn our place, but because we're free, because we're secure in the knowledge of his great and enduring love. So because of his faithfulness, let us serve him with our whole hearts. Let's pray. And so gracious God, we marvel again at your faithfulness to us that Throughout all of history, your people have continued to rebel, have been unfaithful, and have not loved you with their whole heart. And yet you have been faithful to us. You've been faithful that you would uh, even give your only son. And so, gracious Lord, we ask that as we grasp your faithfulness to us, so may we commit ourselves and our whole hearts to your faithfulness and to serve you with our whole lives, we pray for your name's sake. Amen. So as we close, uh, the call is for us to, uh, to rest in him, that he is our rock of ages, he is our cleft, that thou must save and thou alone. And as he saves, we have that final glorious vision, that final verse. While I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyelids close in death, when I saw through tracks unknown, see thee on thy judgment throne, rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let's stand and sing.